Hello. In this episode of Airs for Architecture, architect, researcher, educator and curator Lawrence Lord speaks about his practice, APE, or Architecture Practice and Experimentation, which he founded with Geoffrey Bullhouse, and which operates out of Ireland and Holland. We speak about his journey to practice, his recent work on the 2023 Venice Biennale, and ideas of the civic, the public and the social in his work. A is for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to another episode of Ears for Architecture. I'm talking today to Lawrence Lord. Lawrence, would you introduce yourself, please? Hi, Ambrose. Fantastic to be here. So my name is Lawrence Lord. I'm, a, I'm an Irish architect. Uh, I'm based in, in Cavan in County Ireland. I'm in practice with a Dutch architect based in Amsterdam, Geoffrey Bullhouse. Uh, our office is A, P and E. We're very, uh, we're quite a small office, but that's kind of, that's the ambition. Uh, we're very much interested in the social and the cultural value of architecture. We we would do a lot of work in terms of exhibition making, exhibition design and community led master plans. And uh, the way we operate, I suppose, which is maybe slightly different to others is very much through the notion of collaborative practice. We, um, we work with other specialists, other architects or economists or Different thinkers on um, on a number of different projects, both both in the Netherlands and in Ireland, and then we've done we've done a, a bit of work in terms of with the with the Venice Biennale over the years, and I guess that's possibly something that we'll loop back to. Yeah, yeah, for sure. As part uh, of this conversation, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, so where did you train? Where were you trained as? Oh right, so I I trained in Dublin. I um I trained in what was Bolton Street, then I think it was DIT, and now it's TU Dublin. Um, I would have trained there in the late nineties, emerging right at the sort of at the peak, just before the be just before it crested of the Celtic Tiger. So I would have come out of college in two thousand and six. I also studied in um, in Copenhagen for a year. I studied in the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Copenhagen um, uh, for a year as well. So that that's that's where I trained. And then myself and Jeff, we would have met in effectively the first offices that we would have worked in post-graduation so I worked in an office called FKL in in Dublin and um, the Paul Kelly would have been my tutor in, in DIT and the 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 enticement was they were doing the Irish Pavilion at the Venice Biennale that year Suburban Super Rural which is a which is a group show I think there was nine different practices that were all doing very interesting things at the time but and you know, there was a lot of there was a lot of money floating around in the Irish economy and uh, I went to work for them for a number of years before it all came crashing down around us and we all we all left so that was kind of yeah that was that's that, that that's where we sort of that's where we started practice and then that that actually funny enough it's upon reflection on that particular show that national pavilion that's kind of been something that's been kind of a touchstone to us in terms of the work that was output for that for in terms of the types of practice that we've been involved in ever since so that, i mean that's a really interesting moment i i was working in practice when that when the economic crash happened as well and it was just in a it was a sort of remarkable day that turned into a remarkable permanent reality. I mean, I, our work dried up almost overnight. What was it like in Ireland? Because it was even more extreme then. Yeah, it, cer- it certainly was. So it was in a peculiar way. Actually, I think it's 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 impact. I, I still I still kind of hold, and I would suggest that its impact in terms of being staff is part of the reason that we actively try and not have staff, not have lots of staff. So it was it was it was very quick. When it happened, I and my my then girlfriend, now wife, we 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 actually went to London pretty much pretty instantly. Actually, we managed I managed to secure work, and she was she was still a student, and she secured work quickly as well. So we went to London for five years. That was kind of the holding the the holding pattern that emerged out of that, and that happened to lots of different things. And then, and then as a result of that sort of not having to worry about what fancy door handles uh, you're going to specify, and uh, all these all these various issues. It, it 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 started a conversation thinking about sort of the the broader ideas of what architecture is or different ways to practice because there was you know there was there was very there was very little money and trying to find different ways of different ways of operating and having a critical insight about operating so that the response wasn't always how and what we build but it's actually how and what we think about and um sort of pursuing different terms mm. of spatial practice and different terms of the built environment which um yeah, which is kind of kind of useful. So in terms of uh, you know all these things, all good things come to an end. We had a very 
I, I personally had a very limited exposure to it in terms of that type of practice, in terms of very, very busy, um, high demand for architects, uh, developer led, build more, build more expensively, build higher. I had very little exposure to that. Um, and then I think Ireland then, particularly particularly where I was based in Dublin, would, would have then had a sort of a, had a period of reckoning and a period of drying out and then a period of understanding, actually, what is this really about? And then trying mm. to understand that. So, but you say, uh, what you, you said at the beginning there with, with, with your practice, you, you, and you mentioned specifically economists that you work alongside communities so on, and economists. Has that collaboration with economists been in a part in part inspired by that experience or, or or even even if only peripheral that a kind of a sense that architecture needs to be an enterprise that understands the economization of its own practices well if if i'm if i'm brutally frank i wouldn't have i wouldn't have i wouldn't have um sort of seen that crossover i would suggest though that the 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 people that we're working with in terms of understanding business, understanding local economy, are also very um, they understand policy as well, and then particularly for some of the work that we're looking at in uh, in Ireland at the minute, which is about um, building up community, understanding social capital, and also understanding funding streams and understanding how things change and how things happen. We have a certain, we have a certain uh, spatial understanding, which is which is super and all, but is also quite uh, is only only is only one particular direction. Mm. So that for us to bring and work with people that can think in terms of well, if you were to do that, this is how you might actually ultimately pay for it, or this is mm -hmm. the strategy you might go about to build that up, rather than the metrics that we have, as where we'll we'll do a design and people will love the design and we'll submit for planning and then it'll be built. It's actually building up in a, in a slightly different way and building capacity uh, with local communities and then trying to get engagement with um, local authorities. That's, that's that's part of the work that we do mm. um, at the minute, which is also, I completely understand that there's a, there's a slight difference then in that in terms of the idea of exhibition making, but in a, in a peculiar way, we kind of, we kind of land all those things in the same space that it's about advocating for and discussing and providing a framework where things can happen mm. necessarily being just solution driven, but being also um, moving past the realm of what, I guess, what the idea of traditional architecture is about yeah. in a broader sense. How does that work? I mean, just as in practical terms, how does that work as, a, as an architectural designer? Because I'll, I don't know if in Ireland the uh, fee structure is exactly the same as it is in um, the UK, but I assume it's more or less the same. How does it work when you're doing um, community-based work at the initiation of projects in terms of sort of funding practice? How does one economise that? Because... Someone said a while back to me, you know, activism, you know, in fact, they were talking about the Venice Biennale. No one pays for activists. You know, there's no money in being an activist. So, and and I, I often think that community-based architecture or community-led architecture has that quality of activism about it, which is very difficult to fee for. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, how does AP&E... How do we do that? Yeah, I mean, without revealing trade secrets, and I don't think. Yeah, it's it's. Um, I don't think it's much of a trade secret, but it's. Yeah. Okay. Well, I suppose let, let, let me let me contextualize this. Okay, so just to sort of give a little bit of background to what I'm descri describing. So, the work that we're doing, both in the Netherlands, but what I'm going to speak about is, is predominantly my experience, which is in Ireland, which is. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, has all by way emerged from a project that we did at the Venice Biennale in 2018. Mm -hmm. So uh, 2018, as I'm sure you're well aware, um, was kind of the, the counterpoint to the 2008 um, Celtic Tiger crash. It was for particularly for Irish architects. So the overall creator of the show was um, Von Farrell, Shelley McNamara, first time Irish curators ever for either art or architecture. 
Um, there was lots of Irish participants as part of some of the special projects that they were running. And then a bunch of us architects and academics um, came together and made a, made, a, made a pitch for the Irish Pavilion. Um, and our pitch was based around, it's called Free Market, and it was based around market spaces in rural towns across Ireland. Um, these kind of originally uh, areas that were designed with a lot of love and intent and idea of congregation and gathering and, you know, and trade. Uh, and now we're much aligned in terms of uh, high vacancy levels in these towns. No one necessarily wanted to live in the, t in the town or village centres, people pushing to the edge. So you had this repeated story up and down, up and down the country in terms of these um, derelict market spaces and they were full of car parks and they, were, they, were, they weren't loved and all of this. So this was something that was quite interesting to us. We um, we pitched this and then we um, we were fortunate enough then to be selected and where the Nash, uh, where the national was an Irish National Pavilion for that year, which is great because, you know, it was huge exposure for us. We were uh, delightfully out of our depth and um, and therefore gave gave everything. So that, that's a team of six of us, free market. So that's um, Tara Kennedy, Marin Delaney, Orla Murphy, Joanne Butler, Jeffrey and I. Um, we came together to work on that. So it's a collab collaborative project. As a result of that, and then as a result of the the tour uh, that uh, you're obliged to do in Ireland uh, next year, uh, where we had the, we went to these market spaces, external exhibition market spaces across the country. Um, and a lot of work, a lot of people were doing at the time, a lot of different agencies. There was a there was a policy shift in Ireland. So it was a policy shift that was a, a town centre first plan. There was a there was a change at higher level in government, um, and there was also looking to our neighbours in Scotland in terms of a policy that was designed to preserve uh, town cores, find ways to combat dereliction, find ways to combat vacancy, find ways to reevaluate what our public realm was in those spaces. And then these are the types of projects that have kind of um, over the last few years, a number of us are still working together. So Miriam, Tara, Jeff, and I, and and others, we are working on these on these types of projects. So you might, um, from the outside, you might be able to describe it as, as activism, but actually, it's it's actually practice. So in in a lot of these cases, we're working with communities that have approached us. So community groups, combinations of community groups, new town teams, um, and then we we develop ideas both initially spatial because that was our that was our area of of understanding. Well, you could have this, you could have this. But then finally, after that sort of understanding that there's the soft policy as well, there's different elements that there's projects that involve how you can, how people can, uh, people can, can learn elements together, how, how you can um, make a, make a town or a village more accessible. So it's not just about super slick public realm and street lighting and seating and, and uh, living above the shop. It's about more elements that are feeding into that. So and, and then as a result of this, these projects, these projects are ongoing. Um and and the, and now the local authorities can see that there's a there's a gathering of these ideas and then there's fun for these types of projects. So um like we're one of many, many um uh architects, spatial practitioners that are that are working in this field now. Um mm -hmm. and for us, it's for us then working with different people that don't just think the same way as us, it's kind of super because you um yeah, you understand more about what you're actually dealing with and what what the issues are, and then slowly accepting that architecture isn't the isn't the cure um, for these types of issues. It's one of many things that has to work. Yeah. Right. It's a very interesting idea the, uh, the 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 strength of that collaborative practice. And I did look at that 2018 Biennale um, Free Market um, Pavilion that you did, and yeah. very elegant it was too. It's 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 a kind of fascinating story so so the idea that that you're promoting and perhaps this is where the split with the with the kind of around the millennium that kind of very glossy form of architecture slightly playful slightly playful um if by playing you mean you know, like a like a fun fair really lurid and kind of insane um this is a much more an, an approach which tries to appropriate not appropriate, perhaps enhance normative ways of dwelling in these places. So, how do you go about digging into that? How do you find this? Like, what do I mean as a spatial practitioner? How do you how do you how do you approach this? Oh, well, um, I can only yeah, I can only really speak for AP and E. So, but Jeff and I. So, uh -huh. from yeah, so for us, we're 
and this like this has been obviously Amra is like ridiculously post rationalized, but for us we're very interested in the the idea of publicness and yeah. public space and whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Um, ooh. the the opportunity of doing big civic building hasn't presented itself to us, and we kind of haven't necessarily pursued it as well. Um, but the sort of the social value and the cultural value of architecture is particularly interesting. So, so even in like the tiniest projects we've done, which, you know, may not have lasted particularly long, but the idea of how they can uh, enable or they uh, facilitate um, people coming together in any way, shape or form, whether it's educational, whether it's in a museum setting, um, whether it's in a public realm, uh, so ex ex exhibition works or even uh, different components like that, they're particularly interesting to us. Uh, and that's something that we're, we're, we're very drawn to and different ways of that happening across different scales and also across different levels of involvement. So in some cases, we've only had the initial involvement in these types of projects and then through procurement process and tendering and turnover and whatnot, these things then these things move on to other other architects and designers. And that's kind of okay as well. Yeah. Um, and then it's also it's the it's that's that that's always kind of our starting point. So it's trying to find projects that enable that. We're also particularly interested in the idea of latency and and potential spaces and building upon others, and also uh, I don't know, but also in a weird way the the sort of the the, the dissolution of authorship as well. The idea that authorship is shared. And so it is actually working with people, you know, collaboration really is just about working with people that are smarter than you and bringing people on board that can do things that you can't. Mm. Um, so, okay. Why? So we're not particularly interested in the, in the top down notion. It's kind of, it's kind of working, it's working across and working with, working with people that we want to work with. So we kind of constantly do that. And so if you look through the projects that we do, um, we're, we're working with lots and lots of different people, both in Ireland and the Netherlands that, you know, that, our, our colleagues and friends and and they offer something that we they offer avenues and ways of thinking that we don't know, always offer mm. that's kind of the joy so you learn from those and then you grow and you grow and you grow yeah, yeah i think that's um an important thing that perhaps has emerged i mean yeah my, my experience again wasn't peripheral to that crash but saw the outcome of it and then saw these new types of practices where the architect the role of the architect is somewhat I suppose one might see it as unseated from their preeminent position, that that authored thing. Yeah. Um, and perhaps we can get on to the to, to the, the Venice Biennale in a bit, but one of the things that I've noticed and, and, and your website sort of um documents a number of the, your projects in um both in Holland and and in Ireland, where there's a, a strong emphasis around this word of the commons or commoning. Um, what does this word mean um, in your work? Um, what does it mean to you, I suppose? How are you interpreting this idea of the commons? Obviously, there's this historical idea of the commons, the medieval commons, which um, is sort of deconstructed through the Reformation, according to Marx, or... Um, and various other theorists. What does it mean now? What does it mean in your work? Well, I, yeah, it, what it means to us, well, there's a couple of, yeah, um, you'll notice all the, the, the terms commoning, um, they're all, they're all, they're all the it's kind of the Dutch projects. So um, uh, Jeff, Jeff has kind of come to title those. It's interesting when you well, mentioned- maybe, maybe that's an interesting question, actually, that yeah. we could come to is like, what is the difference between these two contexts that you're working in and working out how you create a practice that works across two very distinct geographical areas? But maybe we can come back to that. <laughs> we can, if you can... Maybe it's just a rhetorical difference. I didn't know. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, if you, if you can help us with that, that'd be super. <laughs> uh, it'll save us a PhD. <laughs> so the, um, so the, the, I guess the, the first project there where it came up as a term um was uh project vadenberg commons and that was a project mm -hmm. we did in harlem in, in in a peculiar way and i'm sure this this might sound peculiar to others but 
um, we we equate this particular part of Harlem, which is the Schalkweik, which is um, which is a post-war neighborhood uh, on the edge of the city. We can see a lot of similarities in that, and then the types of villages and towns that we look at in the Irish countryside, just in terms of in terms of density, proximity to major cities, how c- communities are built up. Um, how people live, all those types of things. So for us, there's a that's kind of a Dutch version of events, and then there's the Irish version of events that we're looking mm-hmm. at, which is much more I guess, bucolic and closer to closer to agriculture. But then there's the, then there's the, then there's the Dutch context. So Vandenberg Commons was a, it was a it was like um, the way the way I see it, it's kind of it was, it was this panorama locale architecture competition that we um, we we managed to win. And then Panorama Locale is kind of, a, it's, it'd be similar enough to, to your pan in that sense that you would win a competition, there's intent for it, and it's kind of particular types of practices that they're, they're trying to support. So it's municipality-led. Um, and we, uh, they wanted to, I, can't, I think the numbers, there was, there was 14 of these, these housing blocks that they wanted to get rid of. Um, and then, you know, Tabula Raza, start again, build up a new neighbourhood on this. And we were you know, particularly interested in that in terms of, uh, working with working with um, local communities, building up uh, relationships that way, and then also the idea of redeveloping the existing. So we made a proposal that maybe not all would get knocked down, and where they do get knocked down, we're trying to hold on to the hold on to the hold on to the fabric that's there in the sense of the the building frames, and we'll hold on to the roads, and hold on to how the community has been built, or then or then or then converting existing into sort of educational or more community based uses. Uh, and then adapting the existing uh, residential blocks that they can, you know, be be more suited out for the for the future. So this was this was the kind of the idea of, um, and I know you've spoken about it a lot actually on the podcast because I listened back in terms of the notion of permaculture or the notion of this permaculture urbanism. So it's um, existing social and then the urban fabric that we're particularly interested in, and that's a that's the kind of a project that's kind of gone on in terms of working with working with the local uh, local authorities, working with the city, but predominantly working with them with these local community groups, and then developing that. So that's and then also as part of that, um, or development, I suppose, from that is this notion of contemporary common uh, commoning. Um, that was a project that uh, it was a research project that uh, we or well Jeff principally. Uh, did with the Rietveld Academy, uh, Vach, um, and uh, Rene Boer, um, where small, lightweight pieces of furniture um, were developed uh, that could then be, um, that were MOBA, uh, that were kind of set into the wild. They were in Dutch, they were called, and I apologize to any Dutch listeners, Vila matches, but we we like the term wheelie mates. Um, uh, that could be seats, could be goalposts, could be stages, could be platforms, and they were and and, and that easy to easy to move. They're on wheels, and they were kind of they were set out into the wild into this island, the Burger Island, um, where there was public realm, but it wasn't really being used. It had been identified that it was kind of there was a lot of potential there, but no one was really um, no one was really taking ownership or taking space as you would get as you get throughout the rest of Amsterdam. Um, and this was to initiate a dialogue. It was a sort of this idea of collective ownership, commoning space, commoning these elements, and different things that can emerge from that. I should point out, sorry, that um, that first project that I that I talked about, Vadenberg Commons, which was the mass plan, we did that with uh, Studio de May, so Daryl Mulhill, an, an Irish architect, and also mm-hmm. with Vag. So it's um it's those types of ideas in terms of looking at um looking at a master plan from a from a sort of a holistic and a social level, and then also looking at mass plans that have happened and then their failings in terms of the public realm. And is there something playful or something low cost and lightweight and le- low in resources that we can uh, that we can initiate to start different things that might have emerged out of that? And again, it's like all these things. It's like when we when when we step away from the strategy, particularly with the with the wheelie mates, when we step away from that, um, what can that become? And how mm. does that get? how did that get used? So there's a series of photographs on our website of these kind of quite lonely little galvanized uh, steel frames just kind of sitting in, sitting in the wilderness on this island. But actually it's the other, it's the other ones where, you know, they've been used as goalposts or they've been used as stages or they've been used as TikTok videos or they've been used for a whole plethora of different elements. That's, that's, that's really interesting because then we have, we've, we've zero involvement at that point. It's stepped away. So it's someone else's mm. and, that, and then it becomes about the public. Yeah. And that, 
Amen. And that and that and that organic, that natural organic process of of the of the commons. And 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 maybe this goes back to this idea of the market, um, mm. the 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 marketplace, which obviously, as you said, your you know your free market uh, work in uh, 2018 at the Biennale. Um, I, I wonder how you find it working. So these rural towns, these Irish rural towns are largely unauthored. They, they may have been architects of some description involved in their um, emergence over the centuries. But they're not what we might describe as designed environments in a kind of um, in a kind of intentional designerly sort of way. How does how I, I guess this is where I've always struggled with this idea of commoning in architecture, although I've been very fond of it and very interested in it myself, is that is it really possible for these practices, these design practices that, that, that emerge out of professional knowledge, architectural professional knowledge, is it really possible for us to, to replicate uh, meaningfully um, those organic commoning practices of the marketplace, of the street, of the... The, the small piece of infrastructure um is this a kind of new thing or do you and, and is this why it works best at the scale that you're talking about these small interventions is it possible to scale that up that idea up uh, i think that's a that's a very interesting notion i suppose there's, there's a few things so firstly i would suggest that the towns whether they're uh, top down designed in terms of a you know as a master plan where you know you've you've produced renders no of course they're not designed that way but there's certainly um with a lot of the towns that we identified and particularly their, their their morphology over time you know there's there was there's a town the, the town that i'm in now um like less than half a kilometer from here is there's 300 meters of very very straight terrace and it's it's 40 it's 40 meters wide and and it continues like that um one of the towns we looked at, Temple Moor, is also an equivalent. So there's a, there's a sort of there's a the idea of frontality and and a spatial quality, and you know you get these diamond towns or or where or others where the roads simply meet. But then there's been there's been the work the work around that that is iterative, but it's the fact that I guess maybe maybe the question is about design is that it's sort of it's multi authored, mm -hmm. and it happens over time and it evolves. Um, but I'd still say there's always a design intent to that. In terms of scaling up, um, I don't know. I can't really answer answer that. But I do know that there's something that we keep recurring in a lot of the work that we're looking at in terms of uh, in terms of well, suburbs, um, post war housing in the Netherlands, or also towns and villages in Ireland, and that is kind of this just a simple notion of shelter. You know, just really really simple ideas in terms of creating a space where that happens. Um, and and the, there's a reference point for that, where there's this market in there's a town in uh, ten county Leash in Ireland, Strab Valley, and there's this there's this very simple market frame. It's quite small, like it's like twelve meters by six or something like that. And all it does is it keeps the rain off you and offers you somewhere to sit. And even that, in its simplest form, I think carries a lot of value. Uh, so just just from a spatial practitioner perspective, or someone that you know puts puts buildings together and worries about rain that is an element in terms of scaling up i'm not so sure how straightforward that is mm -hmm. um but that's kind of that's kind of useful to us i also think that the idea of scaling up is not always is not always so interesting as well i think there's a there's a sort of there's a there's a there's a level um uh in terms of intervention and involvement that at the minute like things might change but at the minute we're particularly interested in mm. So it's for us. It's not necessarily about bigger and more and better. Um, it's trying to find 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 our successes within mm. that. But I mean, the 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 project that you've got in Carlo in uh, Skyfold. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's being built. Oh, that's done. That's done. No, no. I, mean, I was going to say, if they're renders, they're the best bloody renders I've ever seen. No, 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 no. I mean, that was just a, that was a that was a short term intervention. So that was with um, good friend of the office, Emmett Scanlon. Yeah. We worked with Emmett on that. That was post COVID. That's that's an existing building. Uh -huh. So that's, that's us. That's us having having fun with film. Who was um, who was the who was the architect for that originally? Oh, um, Chipperfield. No, sorry, it's going to come to me now. Uh, English architect. Uh, give me a second. 
<laughs> Google, where are you when we need you? Yeah. We used to have something called memories. Um, <laughs> Terry who? Pawson. Who? Terry Pawson. Terry Pawson? Yeah. No relation to John? No. Maybe. Maybe. I, I can't. I, <laughs> not that I'm aware of I, I don't know if that's on either of their Wikipedia pages. But it's quite an interesting idea that you get a very, you, you, you take on a piece of very formal, high-end, super-authored, impositional, top-down architecture in a place like Carlo, and then and then to make it work in relation to the kind of post-COVID context, you intervene in this very precise way. Well, yeah, the strategy was really simple. Um, Post-COVID, our lockdown restrictions were um, were quite severe, um, and it was trying to find there's 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 a there's a, there's a space of shelter at the entrance to it. And in the past, um, people had congregated there, mm. and the move was to try and bring people to that and offer mm. seating, uh, and offer seating where people could um, could you know emerge from lockdown and, and, and congregate mm. safely and talk. Uh, but that was that was a temporary installation, so that 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 that's not that's not there now. Have they stopped gathering now? Well, they've they found different ways. They can go inside. Um, so there's, uh, uh, and, and I guess again that that would then also speak to, well, not only ours but also Emmett's interest in terms of in terms of public space. And yeah. Then, uh, trying to do something which, like, let's be let's be let's be blunt about it, is, was 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 kind of fun, um, but was also you know testing ideas. Um, working working with you know working with reflection working with color but also working with how will this space be used and will it will it be used as how how we intended and well to, we've received lots of shots back from that it has been it's, it was it was quite successful you know that people just people would just gather there and just offer something different and it's a threshold space so it's a threshold space into a, into a cultural center so mm -hmm. it's also their, their part of you know their generosity back to the mm -hmm. Carlo as well so yeah, it's quite that's quite an interesting idea. You mentioned TikTok earlier, and I was wondering whether that, is a, uh, because the idea of the commons in the face of the digital and the the, the emergence of the digital world, um, it's a very interesting one. Like we've become more and more online, but your your work also has that, and perhaps this relates in a way to your exhibition work and this intervention, say for example in Carlo and and, and other and other works of a similar kind, where you are producing spaces as, it might be argued, maybe I should put it that way, it might be argued you're producing spaces which sort of facilitate the interaction between the digital world, between the TikTok video maker and the physical world and trying to kind of mediate or curate that connectivity. Is, I mean, is that something that plays in your mind? Because I've actually heard someone say uh, recently, a, a well-known architect say recently that, you know, buildings need their instagrammable moment like you have to as an architect now design the building and then go and we'll do a little bit of fab here so that i don't know an influencer can hashtag us <laughs> um, God, that, 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 that was laced with cynicism i, mean. <laughs> I don't know I, I don't, how do i even begin to unpack that <laughs> no i mean yeah that's i think that's that is one of the it's like it's clearly one of the key metrics about how we review things i'm 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 far too old and conservative to be on TikTok, but I do have a, I am on Instagram and actually came to it quite late and then quickly realized that actually it's, 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 in, yeah, the visual nature of architecture and the types of details and the types of images is, is, is fascinating, but that's a whole other, yeah, that's a whole other, that's, a whole other that's a whole other conversation that actually I'm probably not qualified to discuss. Um, in terms of the digital and the Instagrammable space, but I mean, they were, they're also just spaces as well. So I think there's a there's a correlation between amazing areas to be in and enjoy and, and taking a selfie of yourself. So it's not mm. it's not necessarily a a strategy that's employed, it but it does happen mm. to suggest that it doesn't it's not something that is that is that is thought about when you're actually documenting uh, progress on site yourself with with your mm. camera. That doesn't cross your mind. Um, would be uh, would 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 obviously you know that's not the truth. You're you're cognizant that this is something that will register and this is how people will experience. And also, it's also how the majority of people may potentially experience something that is made, um, because they may not they may not always have the always the ability to get to the place. Yeah. Um. But as part of a as part of your design strategy, 
No, I think that's a secondary element. I think that's that's just another, it's another way of determining the success, actually. If people want to sort of, they're in something that, uh, you know, a group of you have put together in terms of trying to, trying to design, understand, and then they're, um, they put themselves in that. That's kind of glorious, isn't it? And that's also, that's also the appropriation of architecture. That's like, that's like the public interface. That's, that's what you want. That's what you're interested in. That's something that can be shared. There's something quite equitable and democratic about that and people luxuriating and whatever that is. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but as a strategy now, no, but as, but as an outcome, sure. You yeah. Know, okay. You'll, you'll take what comes. <laughs> take what comes. The, the, <clears throat> you were working, you, you, you returned to the Venice Biennale this year. Yeah. Um, in a slightly yeah. different role. Yes. That's also a virtual environment. I mean, obviously, for architects, I think Calvino's Invisible Cities is sort of a, a bit of a lodestar, but it's the whole enterprise of the Architecture Biennale at Venice is is likewise a sort of spi a, a, a space of virtual value. Most people don't go. We all know about it. Most people don't go, can't afford to go, or uh, don't have the means in one way or another. What was your role particularly this year? And perhaps we can sort of unpack some of those ideas around the function of the Biennale and thinking back about what happened this year and what it was good for, what it did, what it was trying to do. And I don't know. Okay. So, so you were an assistant curator? Yeah. So I was on the I was on the curatorial team. And I guess mm. um I should yeah, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll give the background, right? Because that's kind yeah. of more fun, right? Um, so Leslie Loco uh, was appointed curator of the Venice Biennale. Leslie would have had um, uh, old friend that she would have teach with in the past would be um, Professor Hugh Camp from UCD, and Hugh reached out to Leslie when she got appointed and said, "You're going to need a team." So Leslie's in that. Um, she had just set up the AFI African Futures Institute in Accra. Uh, Leslie operates in slightly. Um, different parameters than the typical i suppose appointed curators um that it was her it was an institution that was that was in its infancy um you when doing a project like this you you you, you need a team so so and he would suggest that some people that had worked with grafton in 2018 so um out of those conversations um emmett scanlon now, uh, now appointed director, Irish Architecture Foundation, and Alice Clancy, uh, architect and curator photographer. Um, and then I was invited to uh, join this team. Um, I hadn't, I hadn't worked with, hadn't worked with Graf in twenty eighteen, but I had, I had, I had considerable experience in, in Venice Biennale and also um, exhibition design. So, so my role on the team was was that of exhibition design, but ultimately, you know, we we worked across everything. So there was also Sarah de Villiers, who's a South African architect, and Fred Schwartz, graphic designer, and then and then other people that were assisting us with that, um, working with Leslie to sort of uh, put the show together, uh, work with participants, um, understand the spatial connectivity. Uh, between the various participants, put together the infrastructure in place that um, uh, working with Leslie on those on those curator elements. So there was a number of those throughout the throughout throughout the sites, and then you know putting putting something that people could visit in May of this year. So that but that was that was that yeah that that was that was the role. It was kind of um, it was stepping away from. A P and E for a period, and and then also stepping away from Queens for a period. They were they were very generous in that, um, but then also it also connects with the type of work that that we're doing, uh, mm. ongoing from that. So 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 that so that so that was that was kind of the role. Um, it was really a really really interesting project to work on, as I said earlier. So we've a we've a long working relationship with Emmett. It was great to work with Leslie. Leslie's um, uh, incredible communicator. Uh, in, in, very generous and very um very aware of, of of the type of exhibition and the type of biennale that she wanted um and then working with her to sort of distill those ideas and translate those ideas and then working with her colleagues both in the afi and ghana and i should also point out the afi research team uh, as well and then colleagues in the biennale uh, to, to 
to deliver that. So that that that, that was the role. Um, what was most well, there's there's been lots of elements that are very striking. I know we're gonna we'll probably we'll probably loop back to the curatorial element after this, but in terms of day to day uh spatial design architecture all that sort of stuff the bits that we were uh we were we were looking at were um so every every year there's there's as you know there's the art biennale architecture art architecture um there's always a lot of stuff built um we were trying to be as lightweight with resources as possible um and so it was an adaptive reuse exhibition effectively so particularly down the corduroy there was a lot of um from the previous uh, art show the uh, Cecilia Almani 2022 um art show there was a lot of plasterboard walls so 5 6 meter tall plasterboard walls and what we were interested in doing was retaining as much of that as possible but then adjusting it so working with lighting working with sound working with linings making uh, subtle incisions within that plasterboard so changing the direction uh riffing effectively on the curatorial curatorial strategy in terms of duality and different stories and bringing people through the space quite differently and but but holding on to that and then working also with color um to try and create a sequence of and a rhythm down a very very long building and a corner at the end um and offering spaces to um offering spaces to so, so for uh for process things or take things on different boards so uh, we worked really hard in terms of introducing diagonals, introducing interruptions, uh, resting spaces. So it's not a, it wasn't a trade show. So doing that in that particular space. And then also then with the center pavilion, we, we were working with um, on the, on the front of the building, working with the graphic designer, Fred um, and Leslie's curatorial strategy, where she wanted, she wanted shade at that point through the portico spaces. And then the, the idea of all the participants in the Centre Pavilion and the idea of sharing spaces um, and those conversations that emerge out of that. And then right in the centre of the building, the idea of Loom, where, where momentarily all the participants in the show were uh, were gathered in that particular installation. So it was those, it was those types of elements that spatially were a reflection on the curatorial strategy and mm. yeah. We were working so the theme was the laboratory of the future what was that this i take it was leslie, leslie loco's okay. theme what was the what was the overriding idea behind like what does that mean <laughs> well, you, know, you need to get leslie on to talk about that um but okay. from what did no, that from your perspective what did that from my mean? perspective uh no to um yeah, so to, to to respond to that, I mean, this is a that question. This is uh, this is this was a biennale about um, African architects and diasporic uh, uh, architects around the world, and um, I mean, the quote that keeps going around that I see everywhere that that the biennale kindly made posters of was the idea that um, the story of architecture is 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 therefore incomplete, not wrong, but incomplete. So it's it's trying to it's trying to frame it in a slightly different way and. Mm incorporate different different voices and different representation mm -hmm. but then also i guess the bit that connects with how we operate uh connects with uh the idea of what practicing as an architect means and the different ways that that can practice and broadening that mm -hmm. and not not narrowing that so there are many different ways of of of, of handling space whether there's something actually happens or whether anything happens. Uh, and then there's many different ways of talking about that. So um, so for us, just to be, just to be clear, we, 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 you know, we, we were not participants, you know, we were, we were enabling participants. We were, mm -hmm. uh, we were, we were effectively ghosts in this operation, which is, which, which was our role. Um, and it's, we were uh, ensuring that those many, many different ways of understanding and describing architecture um, get an opportunity to be shown and discussed. And honestly, there's something from my personal experience, there's something really interesting about that because there's a sort of, there's a, it is an old institution. There's a, there's a grandiose sense about it. Even Venice 
as a term is kind of exciting. So when we were showing chippers in towns in Ireland in 2018 and their, their mosaic tile work, and we put it in a book, but it was in Venice for six months, suddenly something about that makes it people sort of perk up and take notice that there's something special about that. Mm. So that Venice has that, that ability in many different ways, whether it's from, you know, um, practitioners that are very early in their career and they get an opportunity to show their work to, you know, I think the, the numbers are nearly, you know, 300,000 people would have walked past and engaged with their work over the, over those six months. That's, that's the potency and that's kind of the power. And that's, mm. I guess that's not digital. Mm. Elements that can be digital, but that actually critically isn't digital. Mm. And that's, and that is the dilemma, right? That is the dilemma that it's, um, whereas to those who, 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 who don't go, it is, it, it does stay in that digital capacity, but mm. to those who do go, they take those different elements from it because they're, you know, effectively up close and personal and in that space and, you know, uh, hearing those sounds or watching, watching those films or, 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 or looking at the work in a completely different way. Mm. Uh, and that, and, that, and that's the potency of it. That's the mm. power. Um, it's a critical it. device, isn't it? The Biennale, and um, and and it's a it's a way of kind of as as you say, you know, reflecting on this incomplete story of architecture, this incomplete story of modernity in architecture, what modernism or whatever it is. And that has been questioned. I mean, quite notoriously by Patrick Schumacher mm -hmm. um, in a wild Facebook post in which he sort of, I suppose, decried, might be one way of putting it, what he saw as the lack of architecture there. Mm -hmm. um, now, I assume you wouldn't see that as a legitimate critique, but rather that there, this idea of architecture as we have it is too narrow. Yeah, I mean... I'm not going to speak to the legitimacy of it as a critique or not, but I, I think it does speak to um, a limited understanding of, of what we're actually doing. So if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, um, uh, you know, that, that, that certainly it got, that got a lot of traction on a number of WhatsApp groups that I'm on at the time. So um, it was speaking particularly about the German pavilion and the idea of demolition. I remember at the time that there was something about that. So I guess the idea of separating architecture from what went before and one is architecture and one isn't i'm not i personally i'm not convinced by that i think i think i think it's all i think it's all falls under the boundary of architecture mm -hmm. i think the idea of of it becoming a rather i don't know rather tedious culture war mm -hmm. is something i'm not particularly interested in i think if we're not curious about these different devices that are done by non-architects, but are yeah. clearly spatial or understanding spatial in a different way. Yeah, I, I also I'm I'm obviously clearly very supportive of that kind of discourse. Um, I think there's um there's a serious bang of old man shouting at cloud about it. So it's to try and uh, to try and reduce it to that when there is so much like so much work um and so many different positions on show um yeah i think that's that's obviously i would radically disagree with that i think mm. there's so much more on offer there in terms of how we how we view things and how we as architects um how we continue to not necessarily find relevancy but how we continue to operate because the, the, we're not going to just be rebuilding things from here on to eternity. If that's, if that's proven anything is that we need to find different ways of, of understanding what our role are over, you know, um, if it's just around the, the parameters of, you know, professional practice and contracts and providing a service to clients, then I'm not really sure we're offering a whole lot more. So yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that position at all. And I would always urge, and it's something I'm sure you have similar conversations with students. You always urge urge that curiosity, right? That's really what's most important about it, because even in my, uh, in for, for me emerging from college, which is less than twenty years ago, and then to the type of stuff I'm doing now, it there's been serious. I wouldn't even say pivots, but there's been constant iterations, 
in terms of defining the type of work that well I do or the type of work that that we do as a practice and I know that that will change again there's different there's different ways of viewing it so if, if you're just stuck to one particular metric then yeah that's and that's particularly helpful and I don't think it opens up the discourse and that is also what I would argue is critical about things like the Venice Biennale so you can talk about how it's um you know it's not everyone gets to see it and maybe there's a certain type of voice that you know traditionally emerges from it but actually it's the bringing people together and it's having those conversations and it's uh it's seeing new things that's really what's that really what it's it's for so it's to sort of that perpetual education of not just architects but but everyone so i was i've been obviously back repeatedly and um you go from there's the heady days of the of the vernissage but actually it's, it's the months of september and october and november are kind of glorious in venice where it's it's full of you know completely different demographics so non-architects school groups um uh, uh you know community groups from all over all over italy uh, all over southern europe and they're going to see different types of things that are sort of ensuring that the conversations are different it's not necessarily about looking at pretty models of of shapely buildings that are going to be built it's mm. it's all of those other things that talk about the spaces that we share um across the globe yeah i yeah i suppose so i suppose so. i suppose my interpretation of schumacher's and similar criticisms has always been that the claims made about what venice does are so often enough so large. And I, th I think that's quite an interesting reflection in terms of the way that you've talked about, for example, your work in Irish towns or your work as uh, in, in master planning, community-led work, um, commoning and so on, where there is a kind of focus on the, the, the not the marginalised voice so much as just the unamplified or the, the quiet voice in um, uh, the production of built space which then in Venice is turned into a kind of carnival in a way. And, and the carnival requires, a good carnival requires, um, what's the word? Not so, yeah, enormous overamplification, a sort of surrealness that comes from that. And I suppose that's where that criticism comes from, is that Venice looks, you know, it, it, it looks hubristic, perhaps, to the outside world, where, you know, a small intervention is described as, and I speak from personal experience, described as doing things that... Um, it's clearly not. Couldn't, because architecture can't. Exactly. But I, but I, but the show isn't, the part of the feature is not didactic. I don't think it's, it, I don't think it's necessarily solution-based. Mm. I don't think it's I don't think it's a panacea. It's not suggesting that no. architecture will fix all. No. But it is opening up the conversation and it is initiate what's well, not initiating, it's carrying on yeah. other elements around that. And it's also grouping these things in a place. And it's a particular grouping, you know, mm. um, for for that time. And I'm sure it'll go it'll go in different ways in the future. But it's also elements, I don't know, for for me, um, particular uh, projects like that, there's a time factor that has to be sort of carried in. So things will happen over the next 10, 15, 20 years that will emerge out of that. And they won't be just as a result of that, but they will They will kind of, um, conversations will have initiated and started there. Mm. there on is, it, is it like the haute couture? Is it like Paris Fashion Week of architecture, you know, where, you know, Prada or whatever, like they put on absolutely wild costumes and you think, well, what the hell? And then five years down the line in Henny's or H&M, they've got a T-shirt with some hint. <laughs> that. I mean, is that, is that what it is? Is it, is it, a you know, oh. it's not a fashion show, is it? No, it's well. No, it's not. A, it's not a. It's not a fashion show. But I think if you're if if what you're describing is um, uh, ideas mm. um, and how they can they permeate, mm. I think yeah, I think it's certainly it's it's part of that globally in terms of mm. enabling voices and enabling conversations and different voices mm. and different types of conversations and platforming those and giving them space, and you can see that. Yeah, 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 for sure. So if you were to make a prediction, and this seems a little bit harsh, but if you were to make a prediction about what 
might be the critical themes that would draw that you might not all of them, but maybe one or two that you would draw out of the experience of the Biennale of 23. <clears throat> what would you think were the things that Loco's work might point to? Um, well, the term agents of change was used, um, was used a lot in mm. describing the exhibition and that would have been part of the strategy across, you know, across guests in the future, across force majeure, and particularly across dangerous liaison. So it's where those with um, a spatial, I guess, a spatial understanding or a spatial position, whether they're trained architects or not, and how they're operating and how that is broadening. So it's, this this notion of stay in your lane about architecture i find i find incredibly tedious and and quite outdated <laughs> just to be very clear quite explicit yeah. about it so it's that so it's like it's it's enabling different different types of practitioners and showing so i went i, I went there um i went there with students so we had the we had the luxury of going there with uh, 150 uh, students from queens in belfast uh, in their in their second week, so some of those students had studied for architecture for a year at that point, and then just watching the different types of work that they were um, of the participants that they were drawn to, and then returned to, and then discussed and talked about, and whether they liked it or didn't like it, or advocated for that, I think as an experience, really potentially sticks with you. So um, at that particular time, when you're kind of still trying to understand what it, what you know i'm jesus i'm still trying to understand what type of architect i want to be but at that particular point when you're uh, in your early 20s getting that type of exposure and then having those conversations with your with your contemporaries and your colleagues i think that's ultimately i think that's i think that's really invaluable actually um because that then forms a whole different trajectory of where you might go or where you might want to go or may, where you know you don't want to go um and really helps uh, shapes you as you go forward. So I guess that's kind of essential, actually, because mm. it, it makes you be uh, understand that from the earliest point in whatever you do, but in this case, architecture, you got to be reflective and you got to be cognizant of why you're doing something. That is a good point to finish on. Lawrence, thank you very much. That was wonderful. That was great, Crack. I enjoyed that immensely. Anders. Good crack indeed. Thanks to Lawrence for the conversation, and his patience too. There was quite a gap between recording and releasing here. See the podcast description for links to Lawrence's professional and social profiles, and thanks for listening. <laughs>